but live All right, I'll call the meeting of February 3rd, 2009 of the City of Santa Barbara Ordinance Committee to order. Um, the item for consideration is proposed revisions to the city's purchasing code. Mr. Samario. Thank you, Chair Williams, members of the committee. Um, Again, my name is Bob Samario. I'm the Assistant Finance Director, and I'm actually very pleased to be here to bring to you some proposed revisions to the Purchasing Code. It's a Section 4.52 of the Municipal Code, which we refer to as just the Purchasing Code. Um, this has been a long time coming. Uh, I remember when I first started here almost 13 years ago, Bob Pearson and I were talking about the need to modernize our, our Purchasing Code just to bring it up to current practices and, and the fact that it's just out, outdated in many ways. It still serves a purpose, of course, but it, we just felt many years ago that we needed to revise it, and so a little later than, than we would have liked, but we're here. And actually, in fact, like three years ago, uh, you may recall that we came before the Finance Committee and Council to, to make some changes to the monetary thresholds that are in the purchasing code. Those are the dollar amounts that determine, um, for example, when we have to do formal bidding versus informal bidding. Uh, um, at previously, the requirements were that any purchase that, were, that was over $10,000 required formal bidding process. Now that threshold has been raised to 25000 So that's just an example. But at that time, we, we did mention that we would be back for a second round of changes that were more substantive, substantive and that's what we're here today to do. So I, I just have some introductory comments, then I'm going to turn it over to Bill Hornung, our General Services Manager. Um, the purpose of the report today is to provide you with a conceptual overview of these changes. We're not, as you can see, we didn't provide or present any detailed language yet. We thought it'd be better to get um, your feedback and comments, make sure we're on the right track. Um, so we're going to be discussing these at a conceptual level, and then in a couple months or within a couple months, we'll be back with, including your feedback, we'll be back with this specific language um, that we will then present for, uh, for adoption. In terms of the changes that we're, that we're proposing, um, they really fall into one of three categories, actually in some cases the two categories, but first is to incorporate what we consider to be best practices, and these are things that we currently don't have, don't have the authority to do, aren't provided anywhere in our code or our existing policy that we thought we should be doing, and we want to incorporate that in not only into our, what we, our, our practices, but actually have them codified in our purchasing code. We also want to codify what our existing practices as as you may know that there are a lot of things that we do that are governed by policy or unwritten policy but um, but they're not in anywhere in the code and we thought that they that there are certain things that rose to the level that of importance that they should be codified so that's one category as well and then lastly we wanted to make changes to uh, clarify areas of confusion, and there are a number of areas in our code, either by, by just by virtue that there's not mentioned or discussed, or just by the way it's written, that's not real clear as to how things should be handled, so it's left to interpretation, so we thought we'd take the opportunity to clarify any of those confusion areas. In, in terms of the municipal code currently, section 4.52, um, I want to talk about what that section currently governs and, and what it doesn't govern. Essentially, right now, what it, what it covers is, are the purchases of what we call ordinary goods and services. The, the key term there is ordinary. Ordinary goods would, would include examples such as um, office supplies, equipment, vehicles, and things of that nature. Ordinary services would be things of, such as repairs and maintenance, custodial services. And what's not covered in our code, which is distinguished from ordinary goods and services, are what are called professional services. There is no, no mention of professional services in our code. We have, of course, uh, existing practices and policies that, that dictate how we handle those things, but they're not addressed in our code. And we, one of the things we're going to be proposing as a change is to codify our current practices with respect to professional services. And as Bill will indicate a little bit later, they are handled much differently than ordinary services. The other thing that this section doesn't govern are what are called public works contracts. And those are things that are, that are more capital nature, capital improvement projects, large projects. And they, they also have a different process, and those contracts are handled or covered by uh, the, the charter, not the municipal code, but the charter, Section 519. And it, do, it is referred to in our, in our purchasing code, and at some point we th think it might be appropriate to revise the code to add some more discussion of public works contracts in actually this section, 4.52, um, because the charter itself is pretty broad. In, in nature, and it, so it doesn't really dis discuss or describe our, a lot of our, what we're doing now. And we just thought it'd be appropriate to include a section in the purchasing code to address public works contracts, which are, again, 
um, distinctly different than what our repairs or maintenance as ordinary services or goods. And then the last thing is really just for your for you to kind of pay attention to, you know, when we were going through this process and deciding what do we want to um, add to the code, what do we want to codify in, in terms of existing practices, you know, a lot of what we do in purchasing is, is just established by existing practice. It's been evolved over time. It all works, but oftentimes it's not even written anywhere. There are some things that are provided for in a resolution or some written document, but a large part of what we do isn't written anywhere. So part of our decision process was to determine what did rise to that level that we wanted to, that we should put into the code. And we kind of looked at things that were going to be more term permanent in nature, things that wouldn't change over time, or as thresholds might change over time, or other policy or issues may change over time. But the things that were more permanent in nature, we said, well, let's put them in the code, or just that they were so important, we thought, let's codify them. But that was part of the, the, what you should be looking at. Are we codifying the right things? Should we be codifying more or less? And, but just so you know, we, went, we had to go through that process to come up with the list that we have before you. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to, to Bill Hornung. Good afternoon. I'm Bill Hornung, the General Services Manager. Just to add a little more to the background of how we came up with this list of 10 items, um, I'll just talk about the kind of the research um, that I've done. Part of it, I've been with the city for two years, so I came to it with a kind of fresh eyes, and I've worked at other agencies, so I kind of looked at what we were doing, what was working, what other agencies have done that might be applicable to the city. Also, I have regular staff meetings, and I started noticing, like, were, was there a common thread in problem areas where we're getting the same question over and over, or were there the same type of issues coming up? And then I also did some outreach. I met with my peers at different departments to kind of get their perspective of where they were having problems, what was unclear to them. I also do an annual customer service survey, so we got feedback from the average um, user of our department as well. And I did look at what other agencies were doing, and the American Bar Association has a model procurement code. I looked at that as well to see if there's anything that would be applicable to the city. <clears throat> so with that said, I'll, um, unless there's any questions, I'll go into the first item. The first item was to add a definition section, and this is to clarify. As Bob mentioned earlier, there's no definition of professional service in the code. And so that's been a recurring question is what, it, what is a professional service? Is this a general service or a professional service? So to just to ensure that there's consistency, like when people um, work with my staff, we're going to come up with a formal definition of professional service. And the same thing with maintenance repair. Sometimes a maintenance repair can look like a construction or a public works contract, so it's been, that's been an area of confusion. So we figured we'd come up with a definition, and that way there'd be a common understanding when, when an item's a maintenance repair versus construction. And the reason that is important, they, there's very different processes for a general service, a maintenance repair, and a construction contract. They have different thresholds, there's different um, awarding guidelines. So we want to just clarify that whole process. Is there any questions on, on item one? Item two is a best practice. As you're aware, um, council adopted a green purchasing or sustainable purchasing. What? We use that, we call it environmental preferred purchasing policy in December. So we, we didn't want to put the whole policy into the code, but we just wanted to put the key concept that encourage the purchase of sustainable products. So we want to incorporate that and then it provides some linkage between the, the policy and our code. And as Bob mentioned earlier, that's something we don't see going away. In fact, that could become more and more um, dominant in our purchasing practices. So, any questions? The third item is contracting authority. Again, our intent here is to clarify Right now, there's some authorities delegated in the charter. The municipal code has some delegation of authority as well. And some authority has been um, delega delegated by um, via re resolution. Our intent is to take all those and kind of put them in one section just to make it simple to um, decide who can do what. And that is a question. Like, every time I do purchasing training, there's always confusion on who can do what and what is the source of the authority. 
Again, our intent on authority that's delegated by resolution is not to put the dollar limits in there because we want to preserve council's flexibility, but just kind of have a general area that consolidates all, all the authority. One question about that. In the in the code as it stands now, is that $25,000? I know I saw that in the code somewhere, but is that only in the code and not in a referenced resolution? The $25,000 is in the resolution. It's not in the code. Okay. The $25,000 in the code is the formal threshold for doing um, formal bidding. Okay. But the $25,000 for its delegated authority to the city administrator is done through a resolution. Would, do you think it's a good idea to take all of those hard numbers out and put them in resolutions? We had that discussion. The reason we thought it, it would be best to take them out, because if you decide at today's meeting you're going to raise or decrease the authority to the city administrator, you could do that. If we put it into the code, it's going to be a longer process to change it. Okay. So we we're trying to be um, conscious of preserving your flexibility. Okay. If I could, with respect to the to the thresholds that determine when a formal bid is required, we thought, and I think the code still is still has that amount in there, and we intend to leave that amount in there because we thought that was an important enough number to leave in there. And if we wanted to change it, which would maybe be every ten years, we would look to change that. It's it rises to the level of you know that we should bring it back for the ordinance committee's review and the public review of that part. But the other part, which delegates authority to the city administrator, department heads, um, we think that should be left out. It's just that there's more flexibility with that. Okay. Thank you. Mr. House? So I just want to be sure I understand this. This is the, the current authority is for the city administrator is for contract for goods and services. The missing one of the two missing pieces is the, the purchases. Uh, purchases is that of a different kind? Because I'm trying to distinguish between what the current authority is and what the distinction that you're um, well, the, the distinction in the charter it, it has contracts are awarded by council, and that council can delegate the authority, which they've done through resolution to the city administrator, $25,000. Right. Mm -hmm. Depending where you're reading the code, it'll say that um, council or uh, myself as a purchasing agent, as long as things would follow our competitive process and council's adopted budget, um, I have a award authority for those type of things. And then... The exceptions go back to council, but it's kind of sprinkled out. It's not through the code. It's not in one place. So this is not changing anything we're doing. It just consolidated it all in one place to make it more readable. Oh, I get, okay. So yeah. it's a matter of. Oh, I see. So you're you're putting it, the big changes. You're creating the contracting authority section where you're putting right. all that information there. We're, in we're one, pulling existing one, information and consolidated in, in one thing. spot. Got it. All right, and then. Um, and then the, the statement that says the resolution does not specify how these contracts are to be awarded, that's just the status quo, and there's no change proposed for the status quo? Correct. I don't – I'm trying to see where it says yeah, that's that. That's correct. That's the middle of the second paragraph we're, under three. We're always going to follow the, the oh, yeah. normal purchasing procedures that are established. Um, so if it's under 25000 but above, um, I think it's 2500 we're going to require informal bids, for example. So the process won't change. It's just, again, consolidating what is sort of scattered into a single section in the purchasing code as to what are the authorities that are, have been granted to the city administrator and department heads, et cetera. You know, I think, Bill and Bob, what you, you might want to do there before it does come back to council for the final thing is to be clear about that. Because it's, um, I think the, the, the eye is looking for what changes you're making um, and the way it's worded there, it almost uh, you're like it's a preamble for there's going to be a change to our standard operating procedure. Okay. What you're what you're really saying is that you're uh, putting it all in one place in the code and making it clear and easier to understand, but not proposing a change. That is correct. No, I have noted that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's Mr. Vincent. If I can make one more comment on this topic is the second paragraph in your council agenda report under item three gives an example of one of the clarifications regarding the city administrator's purchasing authority. The, the practice has been that the city administrator exercises equal for authority because the, the, resolution, the council resolution that delegates the purchasing authority to him didn't limit his, the way he exercises that authority. So, but at the same time, wasn't entirely clear that the city administrator essentially steps into the city council's shoes, has the ability to exercise or approve sole source contracts and those kinds of things. And so this would be an opportunity to clarify 
the, the purchasing authority that would or might be delegated to the city administrator in that fashion. And the operant term there is it has been delegated, and then it clarifies what that means. Is that my understanding? Exactly. Is that correct to me? Okay, thanks. Are there any further questions? Please continue, Mr. Harnick. <laughs> the fourth topic is adding an operational emergency section. We do have a current practice. Departments today call purchasing. They declare that they have an operational emergency. We maintain a separate log of um, purchase orders that we issue. And depending on the dollar amount, they may need to come back to council. I think most recently you may have seen that with um, the Gap Fire, where water treatment, they had to make a large purchase of activated carbon to treat the, um, the potable water. But they came to council after the fact because they didn't have time to go through the normal competitive process. So what this is really doing is to um, codify our current practice and just to make sure there, there's um, consistency. I, like I tell Bob, a lot of this stuff is what I call um, tribal knowledge. It's with my staff because a lot of my staff members have been here 10, 15, 20 years. As these people start retiring, if we don't start capturing some of this knowledge, it could leave um, with them. And I think this is important enough that, and I consider it a best practice to go um, to codify that. In addition, we don't have a definition of an operational emergency, so it's going to kind of define what constitutes an operational emergency, and then it's going to codify our, our current practices. Is there any questions? Mr. House. He's that kid in the front of the class. <laughs> well, I just I put a star next to it just as, because when I read it, um, I mean, I know that we do this as a, as a standard procedure, and we've um, and there have been times where you've come to council because it was important that it still get run by council, just also for the public to know and to, and for visibility and transparency. I guess is what they call it now. But um, but I was uncomfortable when I read it, and I realized that that if I didn't understand its the need for that kind of a, uh, how you respond in that kind of a situation, and then what. Um, what exists in terms of accountability that it's a responsible decision? So I, I, the star that I put here um, makes me want to have a little bit more said in this, uh, in the, maybe it's just in the staff report or the CAR when it comes time, but to explain um, how, that's, um, how that's managed and overseen in the administrative process. I think the level of detail you're looking for when we go back and wordsmith at how this is going to look, that's where you're going to see the detail you're looking for. Okay. And I guess and, I'm, and it's going to, again, it's going to codify current practice where they do go back to, to council. So it's going to provide a definition so that we agree what an emergency is. And then once you declare it, on, depending on the dollar amount, what actions and who needs to do what. And what the rest of the process is. Exactly. Correct. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. And this is at a very high level, just saying we're going to address something to deal with operational emergencies. Clear. Are there any further questions? I might get you out of here early. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the fifth topic is adding a co-op or updating the cooperative purchasing section. I consider this a, um, the update to be a best practice. The language I'm kind of looking at and the, what's written in here is modeled after the language in the model procurement co code by the American Bar Association. Right now, we currently have a cooperative purchasing section in our code but it restricts our ability to contracts um, let by the state of California, the county of Santa Barbara, or other public agencies in Santa Barbara County. And so what that happened, what the problem with that if, is it precludes us from using contracts from the county of LA or city of LA or Ventura. You know, if the county of LA went out and bought a bunch of fire trucks and they bought a huge volume of them and we only want to buy one, con one fire truck, we can't right now go use the contract by the county of LA. And I know working with Tom Doolittle in IT, a lot of the computers that we buy are on these large nationwide co public cooperative contracts. This will provide a vehicle for them to use those contracts um, to purchase IT equipment. Again, it allows us as a, um, a medium-sized city to take advantage of these large, larger cities or counties that are buying in much larger, larger quantities. It allows, uh, it also proves operational efficiencies because we're going to get, not only are we leveraging our purchasing power, so we're getting better prices because we don't need to use staff time to develop our own separate bids. We're able to acquire things more quickly. 
So it's just a common tool. Is there any questions on cooperative purchasing? Mm-hmm. A cooperative purchasing agreement with them would be for us to buy the exact same models at the exact same time, but in the quantity we need it. Is that the idea? It has, um, yes, but it has cooperative um, purchasing has different can take different forms. One form is for us to actually team up, and we do this with Ventura, for example, when we when we do um, field bids, and because we're doing our own advertising with other groups, it doesn't really fit under the type of cooperative purchasing where we need to go back to council because we're advertising and doing a competitive process. What a lot of agencies do, and we do this as well, so they include a clause in there saying, well, you allow, um, a, it's called a public agency clause, and, it, and they just write yes or no, and it doesn't affect award, and it says, well, you allow other public agencies to buy off this contract. So if they went out and bought 100 fire trucks, and we go, oh, we like that, and they check that, we could go buy one fire truck and get their get their $100 quantity pricing for our one fire truck. It needs to be substantially similar to the truck. I don't know. It doesn't have to be identical, but it needs to be substantial the same. Are there any other questions? The seventh thing we're adding is, um, oh, I mean, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. The sixth item we're adding is buying and selling to other public agencies. We don't, um, we don't have a formal process, and there are times where the city has surplus equipment. And one thing I want to make clear, uh, on this section we're strictly talking about surplus items where we want to buy or sell. If it's a new item, we'd look at the cooperative purchasing section. So an example I can give, a few years ago the city standardized on a different um, water meter. I still have some of the old water meters in inventory. I may not want to put those on. Our normal process would be to send those out to a public auction. We may not want the average homeowner to have inventory of water meters. But maybe San Inez or somebody else has a use for those water meters. We may get a better value selling those to another agency versus sending them off for scrap. So this just gives us some flexibility for disposing of items that are surplus. And usually the competitive process, you want to prevent favoritism. But when we're dealing with another public agency and we're talking about used equipment, that's not really a dynamic that we need to be concerned with. Does it, is there any questions on that? Just a small thing. At, at the very end of the section of, of 6 there, it says, um, uh, when determined in the best interest of the city, and I just wrote a note there by whom, so I suppose when we get down to really crafting it, it would identify who the responsible party is uh, that would be making that call. Correct. Okay. <clears throat> the seventh item is adding a sole source section. And the purpose, the intent is to codify our current practices. We really don't have a definition of a sole source or a single source, but basically, basically these are um, contracts that are awarded without competition. So it's going to it's going to define what a single source is, a sole source, when they're appropriate, and codify a current process, which requires them to go back to council, depending on the dollar amount. And that way it'll ensure um, consistency and provide some guidance to the to the departments. Can I add, can I add to that? I think as, as Bill indicated earlier that the normal process is that if, for example, we're purchasing something over $25,000, we would have to go through a formal bidding process or ensure comp competitiveness and all those things and the right the best price. There may be occasions where it's appropriate for us to, to go to one vendor for standardization reasons or other reasons that would be, have to be justified and brought to council for approval, or there is truly just one vendor. And so the, the problem is there isn't really good definitions anywhere that say what is a single source, what is a sole source, when are they appropriate, because it's just an, it's such a big area. There's a lot of confusion and, and different interpretations. So this is just an area you want to clarify mostly and then codify as well in, in our code. So as it stands now, there's nothing 
in the municipal code about sole sourcing. Is that correct? It's all pol internal policy? No, the code, um, as Bob mentioned it, the code tells you when to go out and do a, a formal bid. And th uh, as I mentioned earlier, by on an exception basis, things go to council. So if we're going to go out and buy $30,000 of park benches and they want to buy them from a specific vendor, if we're not going to compete, that they're going to have to go to, to council and explain why it's in the, the best interest to weigh the competitive requirements. But it doesn't define a sole source and what needs to be done. So this is kind of codifier practice and, and kind of clean up the code a little bit. Yeah, okay. it, it only indicates if you don't follow these procedures, but it right. doesn't say for what reason. If you don't follow these procedures, then you have to come to council for approval. Right. Okay. I, I do have a question on that. Will, since this policy includes, you know, services, and we passed a living wage law, and because I don't want this, the city to always pay all of the cost of that living wage law, I think that should be born in a competitive bid, bid process. How do we... Um, frame the single source um, provision such that it, it treats bids for services a little bit differently because it's more desirous for us to be going out to bid more often on services instead of uh, um, allowing the contractor to pass on the full weight of a living wage contract onto the city. Mr. Chair, I'll take a shot at that. Mr. Vincent. The, there, I think there are very few circumstances where we're going to run into a sole source contract for, ser for ordinary services. That would happen much more frequently with a professional service situation where we're looking for specialized services that, uh, that price is not the only determiner. Right. The, and generally those are pretty irrelevant when concerning a living wage because we're talking about people who are getting substantially more than the living wage. Anytime someone has unique services to offer, they usually get a premium for their services. The, uh, as far as the purchase of goods, I think the council in general is familiar with the circumstances when they're asked to waive the competitive bidding process. It, it occurs in the circumstances that there truly is only one manufacturer of a particular good that they have. It's a, a a patented good, it's a new technology, and the city wants to take advantage of that new technology, there literally is only one supplier of that good. There are other circumstances where some of the departments have chosen to standardize their purchasing of certain goods, and in that case they say, we want, even though there may be other motorcycle manufacturers, we have found that this manufacturer of motorcycles is is superior, we're going to standardize with this particular manufacturer and make purchases only for only with these kinds uh, only this manufacturer for the benefit of uh, the mechanics the purchasing of, uh, of the you know, replacement parts and those kinds of things so those those are generally the types of sole source purchases you're going to see that that's what they've done in the past and that those are the situations I expect to see them in the future yeah that's a good answer Proceed. So, <laughs> <laughs> Just trying to make sure that there's good wages, but that, you know, the city doesn't bear all the cost. Well, the thing's kind of all interact. And as Scott said, I don't think it's going to come into play so much on the, for general services. Uh, the, the next item I consider our best practice. It's kind of somewhat codify... Um, and add some new language of what to do when no bids are received. There are occasions, and actually when Scott brought up the motorcycles, that's one of them for the police department, where we go out, we advertise, we do our due diligence, go out for bid, and then we don't receive any bids. And what happens at that point, departments either need to pick somebody and then go back here for a sole source, or we go back and re-advertise. In the case for the um, motorcycles, we ended up advertising three times before we got a bid, just because the guys were kind of busy and Sometimes, depending on the nature of business, they're not always used to receiving a bid document and they don't know what to do with it. And so what I, that drug out the whole procurement process because we have statutory requirements to advertise for a minimum of 10 days. And typically, we don't do the minimum. But if, even if we're just doing the minimum, you're over a month right there just try, before you even get a bid and can order anything. So 
to allow some flexibility to be done or follow the process of advertising. Nothing comes in to allow us to do um, seek informal bids. It's more of a um, save staff time and it's more efficient. And that's sort of one of those conceptual things to make sure that uh, this is something that, that council would be interested in doing. The me again, the mechanics of it will happen when we develop the verbiage and bring it back. Is there any questions on that? <clears throat> the next item is professional services. As I mentioned earlier, we're, um, we're going to have a definition section, so we're going to define uh, what a professional service looks like so there's agreement on when something's a professional service and when it's not. And then we're going to codify our current process. Um, the reason that's important, we do have processes in place for general services, but our professional services is very different. And as Scott mentioned earlier, professional services, you're typically hiring somebody for their expertise or their knowledge. So you're going to look at factors in addition to cost. If we're going to go out and hire an attorney and an architect, we're not necessarily going to hire the cheapest attorney or the cheapest architect. We're going to look at their knowledge, their experience, their demonstrated competencies, um, handling similar work, and consider those along with um, cost. Whereas a general service, typically we have a specification, and whoever is the lowest bid gets the contract. And I think it's real important from a um, consistency standpoint to document the process, because a lot of times the departments are going out and doing a, what we call an RFP, request for proposals just to make sure there's some consistency throughout the city on, on the process. Because you have some departments that do it quite frequently and they have a good solid process in place. Other departments, maybe they do one a year or one every couple of years, so this will provide some guidance for them. Is there any questions Alice? on? Uh, um, I, I can understand the rationale and why that's done and why the practice is, is valid. Um, uh, how does that, um, maybe this is for the attorney, uh, and certainly, I guess this will just have to be answered by the time it gets back around here again. But um, how does that comport with state law that requires uh, us to um, select the lowest bid? I mean, is it a matter of the qualifications that are up front in the um, uh, in terms of uh, what you're looking for, and then you've really you've got a unique vendor, basically, and in this case, a unique professional to be selected? Or how do, don't we have a requirement that's actually a, a state requirement? To, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, there, there are a couple different answers to that. One is as a charter city, we have some home rule authority over our, the methodology of our purchasing. And in the context of professional services, as Mr. Hornig explained, the council and the city has interests beyond just the low cost provider. The, the professional services, and this is one of the reasons why a new definition of professional services will be very useful for staff who have to administer the purchasing code, is that the historically professional services have typically been those services that the, the person providing the service is either certified or licensed by the state. Attorneys, architects, engineers, they, there is a, associated with their services are a a um, standard of care that is typically uh, backed up with errors and omissions assurance. So these, there's a, that's a typical, the, those are typical touchstones of professional services. However, over time, and particularly in the, in the last couple decades, the, there are new professions or new careers that have some of the traits of a professional service, but not necessarily the, the state certification or licensing. One example that would come to mind is uh, uh, specialized computer uh, writing of code. You, know, it's, you, get a, you can buy software off the shelf, shrink wrap software. That's, everyone knows what, what that is. However, also there are companies that will, will look at unique circumstances for, a, for a, a purchaser, in this case the city, look at their, pro their practices and so forth, and write a, a specialized computer program meeting their needs. Obviously, there is a high level of skill involved in that. However, there isn't really a, a, a certification process, or they, they don't fall within the, the historic definition of a professional service. So this is an opportunity in defining our professional services, whether we want to include those types of services in the professional service process, 
or we want to consider them to be ordinary services subject to a competitive bidding process. And, and so that's, that we'll be coming back with a, a specific definition of professional services and recommendations to council and to the ordinance committee on why we think one type of service or another should be listed in that, in that definition. Yeah, I think I, I get, I, I really do follow the rationale for it. I guess my question is just, um, uh, and you started to answer it at the beginning with regards to Charter City, but also I think the, um, it's important for the public to understand that, that uh, there are, and maybe it needs to be objectified, uh, there's a qualitative aspect to a relationship with a particular professional providing a service for the city, um, but the degree to which that is, um, Expl explicated, explained, clear, you know, clarified. I, I, I would guess that that needs to come out in the process that you establish associated with defining what professional service section addresses. And, yeah, that's true, and that we will. And if I can add to that, in the state code, it does make acknowledges the difference between the qualitative difference between an ordinary service and a professional service. They acknowledge that price isn't the factor, the driving factor in deciding between you know when you select a yeah, professional. Well, so in a, in a sense, then this is uh, already. Yeah, uh, mirror. I mean, uh, mirrored or sure. has a foundation in the state uh, code. That's true. And then, in, in addition, even though we may go through an RFP or competitive process for the selection of a, of a professional, for all those that exceed twenty-five thousand dollars, they have to come to council. Unlike a, an ordinary service, where as long as we follow the procedures, the, the general services manager has authority to approve those without coming to council. So, because it's not driven by price and other factors, that's why they come to council for that added level of scrutiny and review, to make sure that everything is kosher and all that. Um, but even within twenty-five thousand dollars, the city administrator has to approve anything over ten thousand dollars that is professional services for that same reason. Got it. Thank you very much. Yeah, the only thing I, I'd like to add to that is. Um, it is a common practice. Every public agency for professional services, none of them ward on price. They look at their uh, other fa factors in addition to price. So the um, what the city of Santa Barbara is doing is not unique. It's a common practice, and in fact, it's been growing a little bit. And even within the state code, uh, that only applies to community college. They even recognize some of the uniquenesses in technology acquisition that you may not want to buy the cheapest accounting package. You may want to look at other factors in addition. So they treat those almost, even though it's not really a professional service, it's kind of treated that way. So there are some uh, exceptions in the code. Are there any further questions on professional services? Okay, Mr. Francisco, but let's wrap this up, guys. The, um, this is actually more a procedural question for Scott. So it sounds like there could be a lot of services defined this way, a lot of different oddball things. And is this something that you would tend to put in a resolution, just like we put certain numbers in a resolution? Mr. Chair, I, I would answer, I don't think we're ready to answer that question specifically yet. I would say is this, is that we would approach in trying to find a definition that can provide enough direction to staff so they understand what falls within a professional service and what does, is considered an ordinary service without naming individual okay. pr professions, okay. if that's possible. Okay. If we can't get to an, enough specificity with that kind of definition, then we may look to adopting uh, by resolution a list of professions that are deemed to be professional services. To, those are the two things sitting here right now, that the two different ways I would approach it. Okay. The, the preference would be to have a definition that is sufficiently flexible but still touches on the right elements. If that's not possible, then I would, the second option would be to, to have a list of professions adopted by resolution, and that would provide the flexibility there. Okay, thank you. And we're down to the last item, which is um, a debarment process, and that is a best practice. In fact, when you mentioned, Doss, when you mentioned the living wage earlier, when you read the code, when people violate the living wage provisions, they don't use the word debarment, but basically it talks about terminating contracts and preventing them from receiving future contracts. That is debarment. In order for that really to hold up, because you're taking away somebody's livelihood by saying you can't do business with the city, you need to preserve their due process rights. So what we need to do is develop a process, not only for living wage, but there might be other... Um, instances where we want to debar a contractor if they've shown to be irresponsible. And again, I work with attorneys to kind of define the parameters. And I, I would just request that you be as uh, address and be as broad as possible in that 
definition because I can tell you from um, experience dealing with folks out at other agencies that um, often an agency will keep on hiring a contractor that it knows does terrible shoddy work and that it litigates with just because technically they're the lowest bidder but if you wrapped up you know the the costs of litigating with the contractor or the costs of having to fix all the work that they do then you really wonder uh, in that in those instances they're really not saving money right. uh, so um, I I, w I want to, for us to be address that in a broadest possible way if we can we will Mr. Samara, before uh, we're done, there's, a, there's one thing I just wanted to ask you about. It may not be appropriate for right here, and we could talk offline, but I just wanted to know, in what cases do we, and, and, and Bill, you may help me in this, what cases do we uh, require a performance bond um, or a, um, a, a deposit up front for a purchasing agreement um, uh, with the idea that they would, that, that holds them to account for fulfilling on their accepting the uh, order? I want to make sure uh, we agree on a definition of a performance bond. Yeah. Performance guarantees that they're going to perform the contract adequately. Mm -hmm. Those are not mandated by state. So usually we work with uh, the departments, and it's on a case-by-case -case if they ask for a performance bond. Okay. What we do ask for are pay for payment bonds, but those are applicable to large maintenance contracts or construction contracts. But the performance bond is optional. Okay, and it's usually used on the very on the larger contracts or or the big capital projects, that kind of thing. Performance bonds, it's a hit and mess. They don't always require a performance bond. They always require a payment bond. The performance bond is not. I see. Always required. Thank you very much. That answers my question. So we'll be back in a couple of months with specific language that address all these issues and these proposals, and including your feedback. Okay. First, we just need to open up. Uh, just in case there's any public comment. I don't have any slips. Um, is there any public comment on the contracting and um, uh, purchasing policies of the city? Seeing none, I'll close the uh, public comment period. And any last comments from council members? None? Then we'll adjourn. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smyrna.